Well, we are going to review hour five of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. And uh, in this session, we're going to talk about the birth of a nation, and we're going to attempt to cover the remainder of the Torah. We covered Genesis in the previous sessions, but we're, we're going to summarize in this session Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The, remaining, the, the next four to make up the five books of Moses, which are known in Hebrew as the Torah, sometimes called in the Greek version the Pentateuch. And uh, so the, uh, book, the book of Genesis, of course, is the book of beginnings. The book of Exodus, of course, is the birth of the nation. This is the time where the nation Israel is literally begun. You can argue that it began with the, when God declared war on Satan in Genesis 3.15. The woman there, Eve, is profiled all the way through Israel to the woman in Revelation 12, which we'll deal with, of course, when we get there. But the birth of the nation. Leviticus is the book on holiness. It's the law of the, na of the nation, but it also serves to give us insight on what kinds of things please God in terms of worship. We talk that we use that term so glibly, but uh, a study of Leviticus is really the groundwork for all of that. The book of Numbers is a strange name, but it's bas basically the wilderness wanderings. And then, of course, Deuteronomy is the wrap-up. It's actually three sermons by Moses and the rec record of his death. So those are the five books of Moses. And, uh, of course, we're in hour five to try to get a... a, a perspective of the, uh, the last four. I want to comment on something some people will speak of dispensations, and there's a tradition here that uh, you take the history of man and you can divide it, you can parse it into segments by, from the Bible. The first segment being the age of innocence, starting of course in Genesis, the age of conscience in uh, chapter 3 and on, human government after uh, uh, Moses' flood and so forth. Then the promise that was given to Abraham launches a whole other dispensation. And, uh, and, of course, the giving of the law, which we're going to experience here in the book of Exodus. And the, uh, then, of course, the church period, which is uh, the New Testament period, if you will. And finally, the kingdom, when it's finally set up. These are segments that are sometimes called dispensations. Don't get confused by sometimes the sixth of these is called the age of grace. But that's a misleading because grace is always the premise in all seven of these. But uh, they are, they are, each one has its distinctives in terms of, of the visibility they had and what the ground rules were and so forth. If you look at that in terms of our timeline that we've had on our uh, system so far, uh, innocence, of course, conscience, human government, promise, then the law, which is the, 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 the nation, and then uh, the church, which is sort of a parenthesis that we'll deal with when we get, uh, we'll get that amplified when we're in the book of Daniel. And then uh, when the church is gathered and uh, Christ uh, returns to set up his, we have the kingdom then. These are sometimes called dispensations, and they're sometimes parsed slightly differently. This is the classic way you'll find it in many commentaries. However, there's another way to view it, and that is to take the promise and the law together, which that's the history of Israel in a sense. It starts there. And the church is, in a sense, a parenthesis because there is a segment remaining, the 70th week of Daniel, the 77s. So we'll talk about that when we get to, to the uh, book of Daniel and then, of course, the kingdom finally. But um, so those are perspectives that we'll elaborate as we go. But uh, there are three major promises in the Scripture. And uh, God's covenant with Abraham we talked about when we uh, Genesis 12 and Amplified in Genesis 15 and 17. Uh, we're now going to experience God's covenant with the nation Israel. And it's going, to, it's going to surface in several forms here. But basically, the covenant's very simple. If they faithfully served Him, they'd prosper. If they forsook Him, they would be destroyed, taken out of the land, whatever. And uh, that has been their history from the beginning. Their ups and downs are profiled throughout the Bible and their future ones also. And the history of Israel is one of the incredible miracles. And God is not through with Israel yet. Their role in the, is uh, very, very, it's going to be increasingly conspicuous as we get to the final climax. There will also be a covenant with David that we'll talk about that his family would produce the, the Messiah who will reign over uh, God's people forever. And we'll get to that when we get into Samuel. But in this panorama of history, it's been sort of our backbone of our presentations, we're going to be now moving from the call of Abraham forward. We're going to go... Uh, we're going to go through the Exodus, all the way Exodus up, up to monarchy in the next two sessions. So uh, we're going to talk about the wanderings and the conquest of Canaan and so on. 
The book of Exodus actually is the out, means the, the name in the Hebrew means the outgoing, the Exodus. And uh, the entire race uh, will be shedding the shackles of generation long servitude. We finished um, Genesis when they, well, the whole family had uh, uh, been maneuvered by God down to Egypt for their well being. But uh, as time goes on, a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph comes to power, and they are made slaves for 400 years. And uh, we're going to see them uh, in Exodus be delivered from that. And uh, they're going to migrate then to a new country and emerge from this whole experience as a nation. In other words, they'll have a corporate life in addition to their family and tribal life. They entered Egypt as a family and they emerged from Egypt as a nation. It's an incredible, incredible uh, saga, if you will. And uh, in fact, is there any more amazing national spectacle in all of history? A family going down there in slavery and coming out as a nation, and a nation that has endured despite repeated organized global attempts to wipe it out. That's been a pattern. It's not just the, Nazi, the uh, Nazi Holocaust that we're so familiar with in recent times, but from the beginning, there's been attempt after attempt after attempt of uh, 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 the Egyptians, of course, uh, uh, literally killing all the babies and so forth, uh, all the way through, and uh, again and again and again. And in the Persian Empire under Haman, again, an organized attempt to wipe out all Jews on the planet Earth. And uh, then we get to the New Testament period, the same thing. So um, it's, a, it's really astonishing to see the focus of the world at large on this peculiar people that God has se uh, separated for His own purposes. And, uh, and it continues. And uh, it, it's going to be increasingly evident as we watch the, the news as we go. There are three main subjects. Uh, the Exodus itself, which will be the first 18 chapters of this book, and we're going to see that God sends ten plagues to accomplish this separation. And then, of course, the Passover, which is celebrated to this day and is also prophetic in some surprising ways to many. And, of course, that involved the crossing of the Red Sea, that very spectacular thing that was, among other places, uh, 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 celebrated in uh, Cecil B. DeMille's famous um, movie on that subject. Then the law is given. And... Uh, the Ten Commandments, and a lot of other things. And uh, the Mosaic Covenant is collectively the label for all of that. And then we have a very strange thing also before the book closes. If I was doing the Ten Commandments movie, I would have had Charlton Heston come down from the mountain, not just with two tables of stone, but a group of blueprints under the other arm. Because what he came down with was not just the Ten Commandments, which of course we know and celebrate, but the specifications, very detailed specifications, for a portable sanctuary that is a, the mechanism by which the ruler of the universe engineered so that he could dwell among his people. Bizarre idea. God is everywhere. Yes, He is in one sense, but He also is very specifically uh, dwelt with these people on this, that, that this portable uh, sanctuary called the tabernacle. Uh, occupies a good portion. In fact, there's more said about it than any other single subject in the Bible. And that, of course, associated with that is the priesthood, which is also ordained. So, so Exodus, a little background here. It seems to be necessitated because as these Hebrew, this Hebrew family down there over those four centuries multiplied, it expanded and expanded and expanded. And there is, it may surprise you to know that the Pharaoh in Egypt was an Egyptian. And I'll get back to that, I'll get to that in a minute. But that's one reason he was probably insecure as this uh, uh, ethnic constituency grew. And so they oppressed them, made slaves of them, and that was the ordeal that lasted 400. They were down there for 430 years, but they were oppressed for 400. And uh, it's interesting that their uh, rescue, their exodus from Egypt, was anticipated long before. Moses, you may recall, was exiled. He was, he was heir to the throne, um, murdered an Egyptian, and uh, 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 was in exile for 40 years in Midian. Midian, that's northeastern Arabia, is where they will spend as a nation 40 years wandering. 
So that was ground he knew, in a sense. He, he, he was a shepherd there uh, with Yvonne Carlo for, you know, 40 years. <laughs> and uh, so, so he was, that was God's, uh, God prepared him in Egypt because he's trained for the crown. He was educated um, uh, uh, as, as Pharaoh's own adopted son until he uh, was separated. He chose, and chose to be separated as he discovered who he really was and so forth. And uh, then his preparation in Midian. Is, so there's 80 years of preparation before we get to the Exodus. And he's going to be leading them for 40 years more through the wilderness. And it's going to have some surprising results. And so the Exodus, of course, is precipitated by a message from God, the famous burning bush incident. And uh, Moses gets his mission. So Israel's expansion uh, in Egypt, they were given by the, the Pharaoh that uh, was that was favored by Joseph and vice versa. They were given the choicest part of the land, right next to the delta, the land of Goshen. But then this Pharaoh that knew not Joseph raises to power, and he was an Assyrian. We, we learn that from Isaiah 52, verse 4. It's interesting, when you get to Acts chapter 7, and we'll do that, of course, when we get there, but uh, Stephen, the young guy, uh, young boy, uh, is giving a lecture, a history lesson to the most august body in Hebrew uh, circles, namely the Sanhedrin. And uh, Acts 7 is a very interesting summary of, uh, that he, of his speech there. It's a summary of um, Israel's history. And it's interesting, there are a number of things we discover in that presentation that you wouldn't get by just reading the Old Testament. One of which is, he mentions that there was another Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, but he, in the Greek there are two words for another, alos and heteros. If you want another of the same kind, you use alos. If you want another that's totally different, you use the word heteros. And he uses the word heteros, which is very strange, which means this pharaoh was of a different uh, background, so forth, than not just another pharaoh, but a different kind. And it's, a, I, it's um, Isaiah that tips us off, that he was an Assyrian. Now, you won't find this amplified in any, Egypto any Egyptology, but Egyptology's got some uh, uh, problems anyway, which we'll get to when we start talking about... Uh, uh, Pharaoh Necho and some other things. But anyway, uh, this Pharaoh, of course, oppresses them. It's, and he, uh, there's also a whole background as a vassal of the Hyksos and so forth that I won't get into here. But there's a lot of study worth doing there because the early uh, history of Egypt is, is a, a key part of all of this. But in any case, it's very likely that since he wasn't Egyptian, he was insecure in his throne especially with the increase of this other ethnic group called the Hebrews. So that's the, 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 the oppression was, and the enslavement of them was, was his response to that. And uh, so Moses stands out, of course, as probably, next to Christ of course, the most outstanding individual uh, in the, uh, certainly in the Old Testament, some would say in the Bible at large. And he was born during this oppression, but delivered from this government-ordained genocide that uh, Pharaoh had ordered. And so God in His own miraculous way uh, set this all up. And he ends up growing up, educated, uh, realizing who he is, choosing his sides, ended up murdering an Egyptian. And so he's on the, he's on the lamb in, uh, in Midian. Uh, and, uh, but he will be called by God and go back and he will take this race of slaves and he's going to lead them. He's going to mold them into a powerful nation that altered the entire course of history, everyone's history. And uh, so it's an exciting time. And of course we have this burning bush issue. I think all of you uh, uh, are familiar with the story. Uh, but there's some interesting symbolism that many people may, may not be aware of. An acacia is, a, is the thorn bush of the desert. And it's interesting that we have a thorn bush there and it's fired a lot of bushes in the desert can catch fire by lightning and so forth. What makes this peculiar and caused him to take note of it and go investigate it is because it was burning but not consumed. It was burning but not consumed. And uh, so it's judged but not consumed. Now if you rec if in, the, in the Levitical uh, uh, symbolism here, the thorn bush symbolizes the curse. And the burning, of course, is being judged. But the fact that it's not consumed is in effect considered uh, rabbinically as a model of grace. And uh, it's interesting that when God speaks from that burning bush, He includes, among other things, His identity, His name. What name are you? He says, I am that I am. Ichyach asher ichyach, He claims. What's important to understand is that 
it was Jesus Christ who was speaking to Moses. He so declares in John chapter 8, verse 58. And uh, he, he claimed to be the voice of the burning bush. People say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Anyone that says that haven't read their Bible, certainly haven't even read, have read the Gospel of John. He claimed, that's why he was crucified, because of that claim. But with something else that I'd like to correct, when you watch the movie, The Ten Commandments, as I assume most of you have, uh, it's surprisingly accurate in many respects, but there's one misleading aspect that deserves comment. The, the script of the movie gives you the impression that the death of the firstborn of Egypt was, a, was retribution for Pharaoh's comment uh, of the, going after the firstborn. And that's misleading because you'll discover when Moses is called at the burning bush, God predicts that it's going to take the death of the firstborn for Pharaoh to let them go. In other words, that was pre-known and pre-declared de pre uh, back in Exodus 4, not in Exodus 12, if you will, and so on. So um, anyway, and I think most of us are aware of the fact that there were ten plagues that God sends upon the Egyptians. What you may not realize is that each one was geared specifically after a god they worshipped. The Nile was the lifeline of their economy. The waters turned to blood. And there's a number of their gods that was associated with the Nile. Then come the frogs. And there's a specific hect that they worshipped there. Then the lice, or sand flies, whatever they were, depending on that uh, translation. Uh, and then were these scarabs. Um, they're called swarms in the Hebrew, but it's pretty well understood that these are these dung beetles, these little scarabs. You know, it's, it, it, when you buy Egyptian jewelry, you sometimes have the little scarab, the little beetle. Well, what that is, that's a dung beetle. And it symbolizes to them um, creation. And uh, scholars speculate, they wonder why. Probably because when animal feces fall on the trail, almost immediately from nowhere, these dung beetles come. And so they seem to come from n out of nothing. And so that's one reason why some people feel they, they looked at them as a symbol of creation. Um, uh, Amun Ra being the, the tops of, top of that. Then there were some plagues with the animals, boils and uh, ashes and hail and fire, and, and uh, finally the locusts. And then darkness, darkness that was felt. This isn't just the absence of light. There's something else going on here. Each one of these, and I'm not going to take you through all the detail, uh, linked specifically to specific gods they worship. And then, of course, finally, finally, the firstborn. And uh, so Pharaoh's own dynasty, thus, is wiped out, which also explains why his successor probably would not be a descendant. But in any case, um, the, um, I'm, I'm always reminded when I go through Egypt. Um, we left Cairo and went up when you get out of, out of the city, you, dri you, you drive along these roads, and next to the road there seems to be like a, a, ravine, a culvert, a cement culvert uh, with water in it, and these, the very extreme poverty in the villages. And when you look more closely, you realize that's not concrete, it's trash. And the water isn't is gray, blue-gray, it's polluted water. And you begin to realize that this, as you think about it, um, this country wasn't always a third world country. This country ruled the world at one time. But the scripture tells us we become like the gods we worship. And when you, um, and, and, the, and the top of the heap of their worship thing is the scarab, the dung beetle. And they're living on, the, on, on, on that kind of environment. Um, it's, uh, and also, it's interesting that uh, the obsession of the uh, Egyptian heritage in terms of death, the mummies and the, the whole, the whole uh, background. is a, uh, We become like the gods of worship. So here's a country that w ruled the world at one time and today has become like the gods of worship. And we need to remember that. Is the world harsh, materialistic, unforgiving? If you, wor if you worship the world, you'll become harsh, materialistic, unforgiving. You'll become like the gods you worship. Scripture says that, Psalm 135, verse eight, uh, 18 and so forth. Um, that's why it's important to worship Christ. Because you'll become like the one you worship. But obviously the Egyptian Passover was the event uh, that, of, uh, that uh, they still celebrate to this day, of course. 
Um, it's a symbol of life. In fact, God instructs in the second verse of Exodus 12, this month shall be the beginning of months. That's why the Hebrews have two calendars. The civil calendar, which is Rosh Hashanah, starts in the fall, typically our September or October time period. But the, the religious calendar starts with the month of Nisan in the spring because that's the month of the, uh, the Passover. And when God in, in institutes the Passover, He tells Moses, make this month the beginning of months. So they have two months, a civil, a civil year starting in, in uh, September, or our September, roughly at that time, uh, first of Tishri, and then uh, the uh, religious, ca- religious calendar, uh, Nisan. And obviously Passover symbolizes not only life, but also liberty, because they were delivered from bondage. That's the key theme there. And uh, it's interesting that they were delivered by blood put on the doorposts. And if you go to your door and put blood on the top and the lintel, you'll end up doing a cross, of course, which is subtle but worth mentioning. But it's interesting, it was not a basis of nationality. If you were an Egyptian and happened to be in a Jewish home that night, you were spared. If you were Jewish and didn't put blood on the doorposts, the death angel would take the firstborn of your house. It was basis of the blood, not their nationality. Important issue. And of course, it also, Passover also speaks of fellowship because it's memorialized as a feast to this very day. They say every, in the Jewish home, the peak of their year in many respects is the Passover celebration. It actually, uh, in the month of Nisan, there's actually three feasts. The Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. But they're usually collectively uh, spoken of as Passover. And uh, it's also prophetic. It's very important. We're going to talk a lot about this as we go forward. That each of the feasts of Moses are not only commemorative of some historical I- issue, and they each are, but it's also prophetic. And Jesus Christ is called our Passover Lamb. In fact, when John the Baptist first introduces Jesus publicly, twice, he introduces him, very strange title. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, it's familiar to us, to our ears, let's not uh, uh, lose the fact that that's a strange title. But it's, of course, a Passover illusion because that, the Lamb of God, he was, he was given as an offering for our sin. And in John 1, of course, twice. Egypt now is also viewed as a type of the world, a symbol of material wealth and power. We probably have a hard time imagining the dominance of Egypt in that era. It was, of course, ruled by a despotic prince. Pharaoh was a despot. Again, though, it's another way that it's, it's, it's idiomatic, if you will, of the world. It's a type or a model or a, a metaphor of the world. And Pharaoh, of course, becomes, in a sense, a type of Satan, the adversary of God's people. Egypt also represented fleshly wisdom and false religion. They worshipped all these uh, various gods, of course, rather than the living God. And uh, we're going to talk more about the wisdom of the Egyptians uh, uh, later on. But uh, Egypt was organized on a basis of force, ambition, and pleasure. And that our, our, the world as we know it is also organized under Satan um, and uh, on the basis of force, ambition, and pleasure. Egypt persecuted the people of God, and so does the world. You need to recognize that the world at large is anti-Bible. The whole tension in the Middle East is, a God, is the world's challenge to the Abrahamic covenant. And recognize, too, that Jesus promised you as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, that you would have persecution. And uh, living in America, we've been immune to most of that. But uh, we need to recognize that we, don't, we shouldn't have the arrogance as Christians in America to presume that we're going to be exempt from what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 1900 years have had to endure. It's called persecution. And so more of that's coming. But Egypt was overthrown by divine judgment, and this world will also be, and that's what's profiled in the book of Revelation, when the one who purchased the world, namely the Lamb of God, takes title to that which he purchased. And of course we'll get to that when the time comes. They crossed the Red Sea. Israel was cornered against the the sea. But then the Shekinah, this fiery pillar, uh, uh, cloud by day and fire by night, blocked the Egyptian army as the sea parted to allow Israel to cross. All very much dramatized in the famous movie, but familiar to all of us, I'm sure. But interesting, as the Egyptians who attempted to follow them, they were drowned. I'm always amused 
by these people that have these theories that, well, the, the, the Red Sea was really uh, the Reed Sea, and actually it was only about three foot deep. And uh, I always think that's interesting, and that, that's the biggest miracle in the Bible then, is the entire Egyptian army drowned in three feet of water, you know. And, and of course, that's an utter, all n utter nonsense. It's interesting, you should be aware of the fact that a submerged land bridge has been discovered across the Strait of Tehran, supporting an Arabian site of Mount Sinai. The Sinai Peninsula is the location of a traditional site at St. Catherine's there, what they call Mount Sinai in the back of your Bible, you probably have a map. Um, I think most scholars today recognize that that's an error. First of all, in, in over a century of searching, they found absolutely no trace of any uh, indication there have been a million people camped there in the past. You know, it's an arid desert with uh, not, none of the features that uh, the Bible describes. Um, and uh, in contrast to that, there is a, the, the, Paul tells us in Galatians that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. And if you look in Arabia, there is Mount Jabal al Laws, which when you see it is astonishing because the top part of it is, is burnt from the outside in. It's, it's been made molten by external heat, the whole top of the mountain. And uh, it's very conspicuous. And, and as you investigate there, they find all... Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, there's a lot of evidence accumulating that that is the real Mount Sinai. And that, that would fit the biblical record. But it's also interesting then to take a look at where this, the, the land here. Now, if you look at a map, up near the Nile uh, up there, you have the land of Goshen, which was the rich land. But if you come down the western edge of the, what's called the Sinai Peninsula, and you cross at the Strait of Tehran, there is a land bridge uh, just under the waters. Now it's, you find the Springs of Mara, you find a, a, a very conspicuous rock cleft where there's a, evidence of erosion, uh, and uh, all kind of, you find uh, altars, what appears to have been the altar, the main altar, and other things. So it, there's a, there are a lot of books out now and so forth, and encourage you to recognize that, that, that uh, the evidence seems to be supporting the Arabian location of uh, Mount Sinai. But this whole event of the Red Sea parting and the, and the Exodus and so forth turns out throughout the Bible to be almost a measurement standard of other things. And uh, in uh, Micah 7, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, I, I will show him marvelous things. In other words, again and again you find the Lord making reference to the uh, coming out of the land of Egypt as a milestone against which other things are compared. A milestone of judgment because of the plagues that were given. A milestone of grace because the blood covering took care of that. A, a milestone of might because the Red Sea, that, you know, that was uh, God showing off, if I can, if I can use a, what might be a little, somewhat irreverent phrase. God was really setting this up to, to flex His muscles, if you will, because it becomes obviously an uh, a event that uh, the nations take note of. Later on, 40 years from now, when you get to, to Jericho, certain people there would tremble because of the advent of this. this they've heard the stories. They know what happened. It's also a measurement standard of guidance because the Shekinah, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And also a provision because manna and water and so forth are provided over a million people in the desert by the God that called them there in, in miraculous ways. And it's also a measurement standard of faithfulness of the Abrahamic covenant. It's also a measurement standard of condescension where God Himself deigns to dwell with His people. And that's what the tabernacle will be all about. Now our exit in Christ is parallel to this. Our emancipation from bondage, it's spiritual, not physical, so far. We're delivered also by the shedding of blood, just as they were. His blood, not an animal. The animals are just anticipatory emblems that we'll see in the offerings and so forth. Our exodus is universal, not national, because the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. So the law is also a big part of Exodus. The law is given in chapters 19 through 20. The terms, God's terms, the parties, and the altar, the remedy for having broken the law are all included as part of the package. We also have the judgments, social judgments, others, rights and uh, uh, practices and so forth. Chapter, and then the ordinance, that is the religious ordinances, the Sabbaths and the feasts are all spelled out. Ten commandments you're pretty familiar with, I, I trust. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. These are all familiar to us, I think. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is widely misunderstood. I believe this has nothing to do with vocabulary. It has to do with ambassadorship. If you take the name of the king, you have a responsibility to represent him accurately. And that's what it's really talking about. But many people just assume it's talking about swearing or something. No, it goes far beyond that. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This does not ordain the Sabbath day. It was ordained in Eden on the seventh day when God rested from His creation. But He's calling in His Ten Commandments for these people, His chosen people, to remember that day to keep it holy. And uh, the Sabbath is, is, is indeed the seventh day, not the first day. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, so go down that path, but at the same time, we do need to understand that the Sabbath was a day that God did set aside. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long. This is the one command that has a promise attached to it. Thou shalt not murder. And uh, when you start talking about murder, you start talking about abortion, just remember when John the Baptist began his ministry. When he was nine inches long, weighed a pound and a half, and he was still in the womb, he jumped for joy and was spirit-filled. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Interesting command that ordains private ownership. Private ownership is protected in the, in the Ten Commandments, interestingly enough. You can't steal. You know, stealing implies someone owns something. Right? Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. Boy, if Madison Avenue, I think, got, tried to get rid of that one. Okay. Why was the law given? This may surprise you. When we get to Romans 7, you're going to end for some real shocks, because why was the law given? The law was given to expose our sin nature. We can't keep it if we tried. It's there to expose our nature. It may shock you that one of the reasons, and we'll cover this when we get there, but is the law was given to incite the sin nature to sin more. That's a shock. See, the sin nature has not, itself has not been uh, reformed. This is all out of Roman, Romans 7. If you, if, I'm hoping you don't, you're uncomfortable with some of this because then you go and you'll, you'll study Romans 7 to see what I'm talking about here. It's to drive us to despair of self-ethic. You, ca you cannot repair your sin nature. Adam and Eve tried by covering themselves with coats of skin. No, by the shedding of blood. God was teaching them by the shed of blood, shedding of blood they'd be covered. The law is given there to, dry, to get us to understand we can't cut it on our own. God's holiness is higher than we can reach to. And so He's trying to drive us to dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Which is, and that's what Romans 8, the following chapter in Romans, is all about. The gospel supersedes the law. The commandments were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And that great discovery is really the good news. That's astonishing, but it really is. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, according to Romans 10. The ordinances are given to, to present shadows that are now superseded by Jesus Christ Himself. Shadows of anticipa anticipatory glimpses. And we are in a new dispensation. We are, we, the contrast in, is outward command and exodus and inward power of the Holy Spirit. An objective code versus subjective change. A condemning ethic versus a transforming dynamic. And obviously in each case this is the, the, the you, we walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And that's what the whole New Testament is all about. Romans 8 nails this. For what the law could not do that in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So keep this in mind as we deal with God's law on the one hand, but recognize that God has given us something better than the law. Well, let's get to the tabernacle. The last part of the book of Exodus deals with this very strange construction. More is said about the tabernacle than any other single thing in the Scripture. So in addition, you, as I say, these two tablets of stone, Moses received a set of engineering specifications for this portable sanctuary. And there's more, more space to this description than any other single subject in the Bible. It has a structure. It has furniture within that structure. There's a priesthood that deals with it. And that's all in the book of Exodus. The in the book of Leviticus, we'll have a detailed uh, listing of offerings and procedures to exercise these things. And there's material symbolism here. Things that brass is the metal that could sustain fire, so it speaks of judgment. Gold, of course, speaks of deity. And silver speaks of blood. All through the Scripture, um, uh, Jesus betrayed for thirty pieces of silver, and uh, Judas says, "I betrayed innocent blood." When he throws them back on the temple floor, silver all, speaks of blood, and we'll see that the entire 
Um, uh, it was a silver coin, by the way, that was the redemption coin in the temple. And uh, um, we're going to see that the whole the, the tabernacle rests on sockets of silver. It rests on the blood, is the, is the imagery here. Now, the tabernacle, first thing you saw if you approached it was a linen fence. All you could see is a white fence, higher than eye level. And uh, it was uh, about rough, uh, usually a foot and a half as a cubit. It's about 75 feet wide, about 150 feet long. By the way, that makes its perimeter the same as the length of the ark, by the way. Not that, that you can make something of that if you like. And of course, it, uh, we're entering eastward. Um, and the first thing you encounter is the brazen altar. First step you need is to take care of this, the altar of sacrifice. And then you have the labor for the washing. And then you have the tabernacle proper, this very strange portable building. And uh, as we look at it, it had two rooms. Uh, it's, uh, the holy place was uh, like two cubes in length. And uh, then you had an inner sanctum, so to speak, the holy of holies. Holy place and the holy of holies. And uh, as you entered the door, on the left side was the seven-branch candlestick, the menorah. And uh, it's the only the source of light in the, in, in, the, in the place. Across from it, on the right side, was the table of showbread. Twelve loaves, one loaf for each of the twelve tribes, changed every Shabbat. And then you, in this room, but associated with the Holy of, Holy of Holies, was the golden altar. It's always associated with the Holy of Holies, but it's outside the veil because it had to be tended to day and night. And you could never go in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in the Holy of Holies only once, one day a year, after great ceremony of preparation. So that was the Holy of Holies. And of course, uh, in the Holy of Holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant, inside of which were the tables of stone and some other things. And uh, then on top of that, we have this separate entity called the Mercy Seat. Most of us fall into the trap of assuming that the Mercy Seat is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. We use the word the Ark of the Covenant connotatively refer to both of them. Actually, it's very instructive to keep in mind that the Mercy Seat is a separate item. The Ark of the Covenant was wood covered with gold leaf. The Mercy Seat was hammered gold. And uh, we believe the Mercy Seat has a destiny. And it's very possible that both of these items are presently being guarded by the Ethiopians at Axum. And they know their destiny is to deliver whatever it is they've got to the Messiah when He rules in Zion. But what's overlooked by many scholars is what the issue isn't the Ark of the Covenant, it's the mercy seat. It may be the, it may be the throne from which Christ rules. And so those are all topics that you can get into. But the main idea is this whole tabernacle speaks of Jesus Christ. Every detail, every dimension, every material. You can make quite a study there and I encourage you to do so. Because the Word was made flesh and a tabernacled among us, John tells us. And there, in that, in that phrase in John 1, it, the Word is the title of Jesus Christ. You'll discover every detail of the tabernacle speaks of Jesus Christ in a very eloquent way. He makes a claim to each part. I am the door. Anyone that comes in by me is a thief and a robber. I am the light of the world, he claims. I am the bread of life. He, of course, is our intercessor. And, of course, he's our sin bearer. And he's also our propitiation for our sins. And how appropriate it would be to, if he rules from the very throne that makes His kingdom possible. But uh, the coverings, the whole tabernacle is portable building, which was wood covered with gold, panels that were made uh, wood but covered with gold, so the whole thing had an elegant appearance. Uh, but first thing you did, you, you covered it with embroidered linen, embroidered with cherubim, gold, purple, blue, and scarlet, gorgeous tapestry. And that's what, what you looked up, because that was covering the building, that's what you see from the inside. You wouldn't see it from the outside because on top of that they covered it with goat's hair. Speaking of the sin bearer and the scapegoat and all of that. And that in turn then is covered with ram skins that were dyed red. Speaking of the shed blood. Again the, the blood emphasis here. And so uh, from the outside there's no, it, you, you couldn't tell how attractive it was. It isn't until you get inside that you realize the elegance and the, the beauty of it. And then all this is then covered with porpoise skins or badger skins depending on your translation. So it had no form nor comeliness that you would desire it. And yet, if you enter, you discover what it's really all about. So uh, there it is. And that's, uh, th there's an outer area, the inner court, and the holy place. And many people make the no note that the outer area corresponds to the body, the inner court, the soul, and the inner part, the spirit. The body, soul, and spirit is a, the, the trinity of man, if you will. When you get to the, new, when you get to, um, the monarchy, God is going to add some things to this to make the temple. And it's going to be very instructive to see what he adds, and uh, we'll deal with that when we get there. The breastplate of the high priest is also dealt with in Exodus, the twelve stones for the twelve tribes. 
each of the names of the 12 tribes is a three-letter root, or a Hebrew root that's embroidered on each of the stones. And uh, some people suspect that it was the glimmer of the light from the, the uh, menorah on those that gave the high priest his instructions. But that's speculation. Um, then we get to the book of Leviticus. We'll spend a lot of time there, but it's a book that should be studied rather than just read. It talks about the requirements for fellowship, the holiness, the precepts of His law, His standards of conduct. It also deals with the penalties that are attached to the violations thereof. And the, the ground for this fellowship then is sacrifice. And this, of course, all the sacrifices, all these minute technical things, all point to Jesus Christ. We have a detailed commentary on that for those who want to get into that. But you'll discover every detail is anticipatory of the ultimate sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of bulls and goats, but of Jesus Christ on the cross. Everything points to that. And that, of course, leads to the walk of fellowship, which is one of separation, which was the preparation for the coming Messiah. So the offerings are in two groups. There are voluntary offerings, sometimes called sweet savor. That those are to God. A burnt offering, meal offering, and peace offering being three categories. There's also a group of offerings that are not voluntary. They're compulsory, not sweet saving. That's for us, for our benefit. A sin offering, a trespass offering. And all the different offerings are in one of those five categories if you study the book of Leviticus. But there's something else about Leviticus I want to touch on as we get into this here, and that is the uh, uh, appointed times in, Hebrews, in Leviticus 23. Um, Rabbi Samson Hirsch said many years ago, the Jews' catechism is this calendar. You know, most denominations have a catechism, a statement of belief. The Jews' catechism is their calendar. If you, the more you study their calendar, the more you understand their whole uh, situation. It's a heptatic calendar. It's a sevenfold uh, type thing. There's a week of days. We all are familiar with that. We all have weeks of days. Seventh day being Shabbat. They also have a week of weeks, and, uh, which leads to Shav the Feast of Shavuot. They also have a week of months, the religious year, from Nisan to Tishri. Tishri being the seventh month of the religious year. They have a week of years, what's called the sabbatical year. Six years you can plow the ground, the seventh you have to let it rest. The Sabbath, the land, there's a Sabbath for the land as well. And if you take seven of those and add one, you have the Jubilee year, in which, uh, which had a very interesting thing. All the land in those days reverted to its owners. You didn't sell land in Israel. You, you really indulged what you and I would call the lease. Because in the Jubilee year, it would return to its original tribal uh, inheritance and so forth. And uh, uh, in the Jubilee year, all, the sl all slaves would go free. If you'd indentured yourself to servitude, you could look to the Jubilee years at, uh, a year that it, all bets are off. It's sort of like a bankruptcy today. All debts are forgiven in the, in the Jubilee year. So, so that's uh, an interesting um, issue in the, in the Jewish structure. But what's interesting what makes this even more profound, when you get to Acts chapter 3 in Peter's second sermon, he makes reference to the second coming of Christ as the time of the restitution of all things. He seems to link the second coming of Christ to the same events that uh, typify the Jubilee year. Land goes back to its owners, slaves go free, debts forgiven, and so on. So we begin to realize that in these, these patterns that God sets down in the Old Testament lies our understanding for the new. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. But this term appointed times, you may recall in, in our earlier session in Genesis chapter 1, it said, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. This word for seasons is actually hamoyedim. It's uh, the appointed times. What's very peculiar is that... Um, you understand there are 70 appointed times. There are 52 Sabbaths, seven days of Passover, including its related feasts. There's one, uh, there's a Feast of Shavuot, a Feast of Yom Teruah, uh, Feast of Trumpets, that is, Feast of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, seven days of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, Shemini, uh, uh, so when you add those all up, there's 70 appointed times in the Jewish calendar. Well, what's rather bizarre, you take this word appointed, uh, hamoyadim, appointed times, and put it on a computer, you, first of all, in the book, in, in the 78,000 letters of Genesis, you would think statistically those letters would come up in that order five different, at least five times on some interval. To try all the different intervals, and you'd exp statistically there's ex your expectation would be to find it five times. Turns out you only find it once. As an equidistant letter sequence, it appears only once in Genesis. It appears at an interval of 70 
And it's centered on Genesis 1.14. Now the question is, gee, that's kind of curious. In other words, you get the sense that God is manipulating the very letters, you follow me, as a form of authentication. And uh, the odds of this happening just by randomness are, have been estimated greater than 1 in 70 million. 1 in 70 million. So, um, interesting. These are one of these examples of what we call an equidistant letter sequence. And it's relevant because it's statistically significant on one hand, and secondly, it's clustered around the plain text. It's clustered where it makes sense, on the very verse on which the, the word has significance. Well, let's go on with the Feast of Israel. There are three spring feasts, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. And there are also three feasts in the fall, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, the Feast of Passover is on the 14th of Nisan. The Feast of Unleavened Bread starts the next day. Feast of First Fruits is the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Passover can be any day of the week, depending on what year it is. Uh, but uh, the Sh Shabbat is the Saturday after that. The next morning is the Feast of First Fruits, which is always on a Sunday. And of course, when uh, there was a time when uh, the smoke was curling up from the temple on the Feast of First Fruits one Sunday morning, and some women were discovering an empty tomb, because Jesus Christ was our first fruits. That was where it was being fulfilled. Now, uh, uh, there's also a feast between these. You've got three in the first month, three in the seventh month, and you've got this weird one in the middle called the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And there's some very strange pecu peculiarities about it. Passover, of course, four days in advance, the lamb is, is inspected. That's exactly the day that Jesus was riding the donkey into Jerusalem to be inspected. It's offered between the evenings of the 14th. And uh, bear in mind the Jewish day starts in the evening. So the, the evening of the 14th is, uh, is uh, Friday the 13th on the, the Gentile calendar, which is unlucky. See, the, 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 that's the Egyptian side of the Passover. The, the Scripture says of the Passover, not a bone was to be broken. And it's interesting that a Roman soldier disobeyed his orders. You know, to have that, he not, he, I don't think he knew what he was making, uh, uh, fulfilling prophecy, but he obviously was. And of course, Jesus is our Passover. John is in, introduces him that way, and Paul, many places, speaks of Jesus as our Passover. So you, you want to, the more you study Passover, the more you'll be, it'll put uh, significance into the details that's going on in the New Testament. Well, follow that as a Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven, of course, is always a symbol of sin in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag HaMatzah. Ha and there are three matzahs always. It's kind of interesting. Three matzahs. Christ was crucified between three, uh, two thieves, right? There are three on that, that hill. One is taken, broken, and hidden. How interesting. They do that today. They don't know why. The explanation, of course, is in the New Testament. Remember back in the days of Joseph, we had the baker and the wine stew. You have the bread and the wine introduced way back in Joseph. With, in fact, back to Melchizedek, but then also Joseph. In the... Uh, 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 Passover feast, you have four cups. There's four specific cups in the procedure. The bringing out, the delivering, the blessing, and the taking out. It's the cup of blessing that Jesus blesses to give the Lord's Supper, and they don't finish that meal. He's not going to taste the fruit of the vine until He tastes it with us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's a whole study you can get into on that. The Feast of first fruits is an interesting one. It's the morrow after the Sabbath, after Passover. And uh, the, the morning of the ultimate first fruits is, of course, when Jesus Christ was resurrected. And one interesting question is, when did the flood of Noah end? Genesis 8, 4 says, The ark rested in the seventh month of the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Notice the word mountains is plural, by the way. Uh, we talked about that uh, when we talked about the flood, but keep in mind that Ararat's yet to be discovered. But uh, when did the new beginning under Noah begin? When the ark came to rest, the seventeenth day of the seventh month. And you have to understand that um, the Jews have two calendars, Rosh Hashanah in the fall, but then in Exodus 12, verse 2, this month shall be unto the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. That is the month of Nizon, because that's when Passover takes place. So the first of Nizon is the beginning of the religious year. And if you look at the old calendar, Tishri was the first month, Nisan was the seventh. But in the new calendar, as ordained in Exodus, the, uh, Nisan is the first month. That makes Tishri the seventh, which is the way they... And so and we, then we have this strange thing, the Feast of Shavuot. They count 49 days from the Feast of First Fruits. What's strange about this feast is the only feast in the Bible that ordains the use of leavened bread. That gives us a Gentile complexion. Many people recognize it's prophetic. It was the birth of the church. We call it the Feast of Pentecost. And of course, it's in Acts 2 at the Feast of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit's given, and we have the birth of the church. 
But there's some other things about that. There's some mysteries behind this a little bit. The oldest prophecy in the Bible was, happens to be uttered by Enoch, the father of Methuselah, way, way back. The prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ, astonishingly enough. But Enoch, there's something interesting. He was, he's regarded by the rabbis as having been born on the day that they observed the Feast of Shavuot. Obviously much earlier, but on the same day in the calendar. But also it's interesting that he was removed prior to the judgment of the flood. And it's also interesting that they believe he was raptured on his birthday. And that's in a non-biblical book called The Secrets of Enoch, which is an ancient rabbinical source. That, not biblical, but interesting. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, it may account at least for why the rabbis have this peculiar view. But uh, it would be interesting then that the Jewish clock that stopped when the church was born may be restarted on the same day that it was stopped when the rapture takes place. That would imply the rapture takes place on the Feast of Shavuot, which is usually in the June time period. And I say, Chuck, you're setting dates. No, no, I'm not, because Jesus said that what such in days you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Of course, if that's the day you think not, then maybe that's the day he'll come. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we'll go ahead here. The Feast of Trumpets. Many people think the Feast of Trumpets is the big deal. It's coincident with Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a civil new year, but the Feast of uh, Trumpets is c consistent with it, both on first of history. And that's when they have a great blowing of trumpets, and some people try to tie that to the last trump remarks Paul makes, which for some reasons I won't get into here, I don't think fit. And also don't confuse it with the seventh trumpet judgment of the book of Revelation. Those are all three different things. But... Uh, it is followed by Yom Norim, which is the days of affliction, which prepare them, of course, for the big one for them uh, each year is the Yom Kippur, the day of national repentance. The high priest enters the Holy of Holies. This is only on this day throughout the year after great ceremonial preparation. This is the day they have the scapegoat, and they put the sins on the scapegoat and lead them in the wilderness, and so forth. Then this is followed five days later with the Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. And uh, this presumably, or called the Feast of Tabernacles, it's very possible that this was the day, this was the season that uh, 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 Matthew 17 takes place, the, the uh, uh, Transfiguration, Mount Transfiguration, because P Peter is preoccupied about making three booths. These booths are interesting because, uh, uh, and you go to Israel, or in, even a, 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 among observant Jews, you'll discover they actually still do this today. They'll build a booth in the backyard. The specifications require that you can see the sky through the ceiling and the wind can blow through the walls. The idea is to uh, typify, represent the temporary dwellings they endured while wandering the wilderness. And the Feast of Booths climaxes when they leave that for their permanent dwellings. And that's why some people feel that this is the setting up of Christ's kingdom and so forth. And uh, anyway, let's get on to the uh, other books here to wrap up the Torah. Book of Numbers deals with the wilderness wanderings. And uh, in fact, the Hebrew term for the book isn't Numbers, it's uh, Be Midar, which is uh, in, it's in the wilderness. And uh, the Greek called it Erith Moe uh, in the Latin numeri, because it happens to include two censuses, so that's why they call it the numbering of the people, which isn't the most relevant part of the book, but that's where it gets its title within the Greek translation and thus our English translation. That's not the Hebrew term. But anyway, Numbers continues where Exodus left off. We paused Exodus to do Leviticus, get all that background, but then we jump in and pick up where Exodus left off. And Numbers is a book about arrested progress. They blew it. It took only 40 hours to get uh, Israel out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. 40 years of wilderness wandering. Very strange thing. There's a place called Kadesh Barnea. And after 40 days getting there, Moses sends out 12 spies. They're at the border to enter the land that's been prom the promised land. Ten of the 12 come back terrified. And don't knock it. They had reason to be terrified. It says, there we saw the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. There were giants in the land, these strange hybrids, very similar to the ones that we encountered before the flood. Different occasion, but same kind of thing. Nephilim, the fallen ones. Giants is the way it's translated. But they're more than just giants. They were hybrids, apparently uh, uh, mischief by the fallen angels again. So these ten were justifiably frightened, but two of them, Joshua and Caleb, were unimpressed. They said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we will el we'll, uh, are well able to overcome it. Why? Because God's with them. If God's on your side, you're a majority. <laughs> Plus. <laughs> so remember Joshua and Caleb were the two of the twelve that came back with a good report. The other ten had their knees uh, knocking. So... 
we have a lost opportunity. And the people of children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? The people are shook by the report of the ten spies. And they say, gee, it would have been better off if we had died. And God says, good idea. Funny you should mention. <laughs> so God threatens to wipe out everybody. But Moses intercedes. Prayer is always God's way of enlisting you in what He wants to do, by the way. Keep that in mind. So God says, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number of twenty years old and upward, which ye have murmured against me. In other words, those adults that were murmuring are going to pass on. He didn't wipe them all out. He let them live their natural lives. They're going to wander until that whole generation's gone. Their children, who weren't accountable to murder, remember, they're the ones that are going to inherit. There's only two exceptions made. Joshua and Caleb, they had the good report. They become the leaders that will then endure after those forty years, to lead the, the conquest of the land. So Joshua and Caleb and the, and the children of the murmurs entered the land. The others passed away. Forty years, actually thirty-eight, but who's, who's quibbling? God prepared Moses, of course, for the forty years. He had, remember, he'd married Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian, on the east shore of the Aqaba. The Midianites, by the way, descended from Keturah. So they're not even, they're not uh, descendant from Sarah, but we we'll won't get into that here. And the real Mount Sinai, of course, is in Midian. So it's, it's a Midian thing. So Now, why is all this going on? The New Testament tells us all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul in his letter makes the point that all these details, all these stories in the Old Testament are there for our understanding and learning. The tragedy in most Christian churches, they've abandoned the Old Testament. They, well, the New Testament fulfilled the Old, so they don't bother with the Old. As, real, as a result, they don't really understand the New Testament. And so we want to, uh, this word examples, by the way, is actually the word uh, tupos, which means it's a word from which we get type or prototype, a figure, an image, a prefiguring. And the Bible is full of those. They're, most, they're some of the most exciting discoveries is when you begin to, uh, the Holy Spirit leads you to see some of these types or, or models that we'll so look at. Let you give you one of them is manna. Remember in manna, they, were, they needed food. So God gave them the supernatural bread that fell every night, the manna. He also, there was a strange incident of the brazen serpent that uh, where uh, they're getting bit by snakes and, and God has those that has Moses make a brass serpent, put it on a hill, and those that look at the hill get, uh, get healed. What a strange way to do a healing. Then the water's from a rock. How many times have you ever struck a rock and had water fall come out of it, right? But it happens twice. And there's something about the order of the camp I want to show you. I'm just, I'm, there's dozens of these things in Numbers. I've just picked a few to give you a flavor of it. The manna. They were in need of food, so God provided daily provision of manna, a miracle bread from heaven, right? And it's interesting that uh, it was to be provided six days. On the seventh day it wouldn't come. So on the sixth day you're supposed to pick up twice as much. Normally you didn't take more than you need for a day. It would spoil. And, but that one day, if you took twice as much for the day that it wouldn't fall, you're all set. You've got a double portion of the sixth to prevent you gathering any on Shabbat, on the Sabbath day. And by the way, I want you to notice something. This was before the law was given. This, isn't, this happens to be in Exodus 16. The law was given in Exodus 20. So this is in advance. They were observing the Shabbat, uh, Shabbat before the law was given. Very important idea. Then we've got the brazen serpent. And by the way, I'll, I'll come back. Each one of these is, is points to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. The brazen serpent. Weird deal. In response to murmuring, murmuring God sent fiery serpents which bit the people and they died. Moses intercedes. And then he's instructed to place a brass serpent on a pole on a high hill and all that would look t uh, toward it would be spared. Now if you're in the book of Numbers 21 and you read this, that's weird. What a strange way to heal people. But that's what God chose. And uh, you don't understand this if you read, you go through the whole Old Testament. This comes up later in Hezekiah. This brass serpent's still around. People are worshiping it, so he destroys it because it's become an idol. But still, you have no explanation. What's going on here? Brass? Serpent? A serpent's a type of sin. You put sin up on a, on a, on a, on a hill? What, what's going on here? Jesus explains it to you in John chapter 3. You see? 
As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, this, this serpent remedy in Numbers 21 was deliberately designed by God to anticipate the ultimate remedy we have in Jesus Christ. That's called a macro code. That's the macro code. It's an anticipatory code of structure. On a word processor, if you're doing your word processor, and you're going to send a fax or, or make an email or a letter, often you can hit one key that'll format it for you, and you go and put your stuff in it, and it becomes a fax. You know, it's an anticipatory code, a macro, a macro code in the computer parlance, a code that anticipates subsequent content. That's exactly what the, the brazen serpent thing does. But it means that the, the designer of that code is outside the dimensionality of time because he knows what's coming, and he models it to anticipate what's coming. It's one of the subtle demonstrations that the Bible had its origin outside the space-time domain. But uh, we got, and it's interesting that this comment by Jesus Christ in John 14 is the setup for the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a word, what a verse that is! Justifiably the best known verse in the Bible. Well, we get to the waters of Meribah. Now, this is a strange one. At Rephidim, they were without water. God says to Moses, take your staff, strike the rock, and water will come. And it did. That's in Exodus 17. And they get their water. Incredible, incredible miracle. Many years later, they're at Mirabah, another location. They're again without water. This time, Moses is just frustrated with the people. And God tells Moses, take, go to that rock and speak to it, and it'll give you water. Moses goes out there, and he takes a staff like he did before, and strikes the rock with his staff. The water came, the people got their water, but God says, Moses? And he puts him in the penalty box. He said, see, because you misrepresented me to the people. I wasn't mad at them. You were mad at them. You gave the impression to them that I was mad at them. I wasn't. You've misrepresented me. You get the picture? But what happens as a result of that is a shock. Get the picture here. Moses was f uh, uh, 40 years in training in Egypt, goes 40 years to Midian to get in the wilderness to get prepped for the exodus, comes and, and uh, is leading these people. Another 40, he's 120 years old. And his dream through these 120 years was to be able to lead the people into the promised land. God says, hey Moses, you didn't do what I told you to do. You didn't follow directions. So you're not going to go in the promised land. Your people will go, but you're not going to go. You can see it from the hill. We'll let you up the hill and get you a look at it. But uh, uh, he didn't make it. And so he gets a chance to see it from the land. He passes away. God himself buries Moses, which is weird. That's interesting. What's even weirder is that Satan and Michael fight over his body. It's not mentioned in the Bible there, but it's alluded to in the book of Jude. We'll deal with it when we get there. But when you study this, there is something kind of interesting here. If Moses had done what God told him to do, the two water from the rock events would profile the first and second coming of Christ. He was smitten the first time, not the second time. You follow me? You can be, it could have been a model, and that could be one of the reasons God was frustrated with Moses, because he didn't do what he was told. If he had, we'd enjoy another one of these very profound types. But uh, the type, we do know that the rock, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, the rock was Jesus Christ. He's the source of our living water. And uh, he got, we got the first time because he was struck, he was smitten. Second time for the asking. And that's the way it would have been if Moses had, had done it the way God told him to. And because of his failure to follow directions, Moses is denied entry in the promised land. That should chill us. Here's, a, here's Moses, his faithful servant, but he did blow it, and he takes the penalty of it. But I want to show you something else that may come as a surprise, because uh, you always say everything in the Scripture is there by design. And some people challenge me, say, what about Numbers 2? It's a boring chapter, a lot of numbers and stuff. Is every detail there by design? What might be hidden behind the details of the camp of Israel? Jesus said in Psalm 40, verse 7, and also Hebrews 10, 7 is quoted, the volume of the book is written of me. Every detail in the Bible points to Jesus Christ. Let's challenge this here. 
If you wade through Numbers 2, you'll discover they number each of the tribes. Judah has 74,600, Issachar 54,4, etc., etc. They're all on the screen here. Uh, and these numbers are the men older than 20 able to go to war. So it does, include, does not include the children or women, and does include the aged. Follow me? So to find out what the real population is, you probably have to multiply each one of these by some factor, two or three, pick a number, to, to account for the wife, any you know, some. But these are, so these are core populations. And you go through all of these, say, gee, check, that's exciting. What do I do with all that information? Well, bear with me. Something else you'll learn in Numbers is that these 12 tribes are to muster into four camps. There's the camp of Judah, where Issachar and Zebulun muster with him and under his ensign. And then there's a camp of Reuben, where Simeon and Gad muster under his ens uh, thing. Judah, of course, had a lion, a lion of the tribe of Judah. It was on his ensign. They'd all rust must Each one had a symbol on their ensign. It comes from the tw 12 signs of the, the uh, Matzeroth. But uh, Judah is the lead of the, of, uh, of the camp, what they call the camp of Judah. Reuben, Simeon, Gad become the camp of Reuben. He, his symbol is a man and uh, his ensign, and they rally around that. Ephraim uh, is, has as a symbol an ox, strength, beast of burden. And uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin rally around that. Which figures, because Benjamin and Joseph were, Ephraim and Manasseh were sons of Joseph, right? And Joseph and, and uh, Benjamin were the children of Rachel. They were in a very privileged group. Anyway, and then we've got Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Dan was originally a serpent, but uh, Ahizer, the head of the tribe of Dan, didn't like that, so he switched it to an eagle with a serpent in its mouth, by the way. And that's recorded in, uh, in some of the Bible handbooks. But anyway, uh, you say, so there, there you go. You say, geez, that's, that's, uh, that's really thrilling that you gave us that information. What do I do with it? Well, notice that these camps, then, are slightly different sizes. Okay. In the center of the camp is the tribe of Levi, the tabernacle. And uh, it's always faced through the, 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 on the east side is where the door is. And the Levites take care of this. The three families of the Levites, the uh, Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the Merarites, have all kinds of duties to, to, to deal with this moving portable. But Moses and his brother Aaron and the priests are on the east side. Not all Levites are priests. Sons of Aaron are priests. Okay. And so I want you to be respect Levitical. You need to think like a rabbi here. They tried. Give them credit. They tried very hard to be precise in doing what God said. The camp of Judah was to camp east of the Levites, okay? The camp of Reuben south of the Levites, and to be strict obedient to these, that denies the area that's southeast. You're either east or south, you can't be southeast because then you're neither south or east. In other words, only the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, are ordained in the Torah. And only the width of Levite's camp would be allowed. And the length would be proportional. So here you have the Levites in the middle, and when you number those, there are about 22,000 there. And however, I don't know how wide they were, whether it's 100 yards or 100 miles, call it whatever, but its width is a unit we're going to deal with. So Judah, with a, under the tribal uh, standard of a lion, would camp as wide as Levites and then take as much space as they needed eastward, right? And uh, Reuben uh, was to the south. He had a symbol of a man, and they would camp there and take the, as wide as the Levites were, they're, they're, cause they're, as long as they're, they're, they can be south, as long as they're no wider than the Levites, and out they go. And it leaves a question, what about here? What about in the between these two? Well, that's southeast. It's neither south nor east, so that wouldn't be rabbinically comfortable, right? And so likewise, we've got southwest, northwest, northeast as, as areas that are not specified for any of the tribes. Ephraim, with the symbol of the ox, would go to the west, and Dan, with his eagle, having substitute for the serpent, um, all uh, these come from the pr prophecies of Jacob in Genesis 49, but in any case, uh, there's Dan with the eagle, and uh, so there we have it. Now the question is, okay, we've got, we've got the arrangement, but these populations of those camps are different. The largest was Judah, the smallest was Ephraim, and the other two are about the same. So what I want to do here is imagine that we have a helicopter out here that we're going to take a trip. And the helicopter I've arranged for is a very unusual one because it's also a time machine. And so as we get in this, collectively imagine in our ma imagination, get in this helicopter, we're going to fly over to Israel. And uh, we're going to have it also go backwards in time to the time of the wilderness wanderings. And uh, as it goes there, we're going to approach from the east 
And we will see right in the middle of the camp, of course, the Levite area with the tabernacle. And then we'll see these four arms. But as we get there, we'll also see the arms in proportion. And so as we approach in our imaginary helicopter, what do we see? A what? A cross, exactly, exactly. Judah was 186, four, uh, 186 units, and, and uh, uh, Ephraim only 108, and the other two roughly 150. So, yes, it's a, it's a scale drawing of a, of a cross. I think it's very interesting. There's a, here's a sketch from the air of the camp of Israel in the, hidden away in Numbers chapter 2, if you know how to look. And uh, I think that's kind of fun. And, of course, that, needless to say, is a model of the throne of God. We have God sitting in the middle with His throne and the rest of it. And he's surrounded by an ox, a man, an eagle, and a lion. If you've done your Bible homework, you know that from Isaiah 6 and uh, Ezekiel 1 and 10 and Revelation, there's always cherubim around guarding the throne of God that have faces, right? Four faces. An ox, a man, an eagle, and a lion, which also profile the four Gospels, but we'll get, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Last uh, book in the Torah is Deuteronomy, where the laws are reviewed. And... Uh, it's sort of a bridge between the first four books of the Torah outside the land and the next seven books which will be in the land. So it's like a bridge in that sense. It's actually three sermons by Moses and the record of his death. It includes some great things. The Shema, of course, the great commandment. There are more, this is probably Jesus' favorite book. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy more than he does any other book of the Bible. The Song of Moses, which is a prophecy all over the twelve tribes, has some surprising little tidbits hidden away in it. The book, of course, concludes with the death of Moses, obviously added by a, a scribe, uh, but uh, it has, uh, we know that M Michael fights with Satan over his body, as the book of Jude talks about. There's also the transfiguration appearance. Moses will show up on, in Matthew 17 along with Elijah at the transfiguration. That's a strange thing. And it's my personal suspicion that he is one of the two witnesses that show up in Revelation 11. Scholars have different views. That happens to be why, and I have some reasons we'll deal with when we get there. But you should know the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This obviously is on every doorpost of every Jewish dwelling. Typically they have a little masusa with a scripture, and the scripture is usually the Shema that's in there. Uh, it's also the very verse that Jesus quotes as the greatest commandment. And uh, so in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, the Shema. Now, it, and it goes on then to say, These words which I command thee as they shall be in thine heart, thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou get, risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. And that's why they do that. That's why they often uh, will uh, celebrate with little leather pouches on their wrists and on their forehead, which carry scripture, they, the, the, the phylacteries as they call them. And uh, it's interesting that a Jewish home will always have that on the, on the doorpost. Now, um, it's interesting that there's only one form of biblical schooling in the Bible. It's called homeschooling. Just thought I'd throw that out to offend any teachers that are here. Um, <laughs> but uh, the Shema also says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The word one there in the Hebrew is echad. It means compound unity, a collective sense. It's plurality and unity, like one cluster of grapes is the way it would be appropriate. It is not the word Yahid, which would be absolute unity, like one singular, which is never used of Yehovah, or Yahweh, or however you want to pronounce it. The word that's translated Lord, Yahweh, uh, is, appears three times just in this verse. But the book also, Numbers concludes with the, the dangers of compromise, because there's two and a half tribes, Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh, that really like the ground up there in the place called Bashan, good cattle ground. That's the land they want. But they haven't conquered the land yet. But they ask Moses, that's what they want for the land. And uh, it's a compromise of sight, sort of like Lot had done, by the way. But uh, Moses agrees that they can have it after they conquer the land. They want the tribes to be with them as they march in and conquer the land of Canaan. When they finish the conquest, yes, they can go back and that'll be their allotment. And uh, so they, uh, uh, and they will, they'll return. And the region that they're talking about is a region we call the Golan Heights. This region was the first to fall to idolatry. It was the first to go into captivity. And it remains to this day the vulnerable buffer zone uh, of Israel. Well, this concludes, this concludes a rather hurried, quick snapshot of the remainder of the Torah. In the next session, it's a military session with some real surprises. Joshua. 
The first thing you should be alert to, Yehoshua, is the Hebrew, which would be translated into Greek, would be Jesus. So we have Jesus on a name of the book of the Old Testament. That should get your attention. It's a military thing, a military conquest of Canaan. And we're going to talk about the long day of Joshua that many Christians have trouble with. We'll deal with that very directly. Then we get to the book of Judges, 350 years of doing what was right in their own eyes. It's going to tell you what value relativism will lead to. And then we have the, the, the dessert for the whole evening will be the book of Ruth, a little four-chapter book that's probably my favorite book. I can't say it because they're all favorites, I guess, but Ruth is um, a treasure, and you'll be surprised what little treasures are hidden away in the book. You will not understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the book of Ruth. And so uh, with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We're, we stand in awe of your word and the extremes you've gone to that we might have your illumination. We thank you, Father, for these little treasures you've hidden around every corner. But we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate all of this to put it in perspective for our lives, that we might understand what it is you would have of us in the days that remain. We do pray, Father, that you would oh, just reignite in each of us a new passion, a new hunger for your word, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that we might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us. We do pray, Father, that you just open our hearts and lives to your word. As we commit ourselves into your hands, without any reservation, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you. We five minutes early. That should be all right.